The story of Sharaya and Sharazad, his vizier's daughter. Part 1 There were once two kings called Sharaya and Shazaman. They were brothers. Sharaya was an important king. He ruled all of Persia, India, and China. Shazaman, his younger brother, was the king of Samarkand. One day, Sharaya said to his vizier, I'd like to see my brother. Go to his palace in Samarkand and invite him to India. The vizier, who had two daughters, Sharazad and Dinazad, made preparations for his long journey. He and his servants travelled day and night. When they arrived in Samarkand, the king greeted the vizier warmly. Welcome to Samarkand, he said. Tell me, how is my brother? He is well, your majesty, but he'd like to see you again. He told me to invite you to India. I'll prepare for the journey immediately, said the king. You and your servants can put your tents in the big field outside the city walls. Wait for me there. One evening, ten days later, Shah Zaman arrived at the vizier's camp. We'll start our journey early tomorrow morning, he told the vizier, and then he went to bed. At midnight, the vizier received a visit from the king. I'd like to say goodbye to my wife one more time, he said. I'm going to return to the city. Shah Zaman rode back to the palace and went straight to his wife's bedroom and opened the door. She was there in bed, but she wasn't alone. She was with one of the kitchen boys. Shah Zaman was very angry. He took out his sword and killed both of them. Then he returned to the camp. The next day, the king, the vizier, and all their servants left Samarkand. They travelled for many days and nights. Finally, they arrived at the royal palace in India. Sharaya came out to greet his brother. He was very happy to see him again. He gave him clean clothes, food and drink. He gave him a palace to stay in. That palace will be your home here, he said. But you must come and see me every day. The two brothers spent the days pleasantly. They talked, played chess and walked in the gardens. But Shah Zaman thought about his wife all the time. He was very sad. He stopped eating. He became thin and pale. His brother was worried. Perhaps he wants to go home, he thought. I'll send him back soon. One morning, Sharaya said, I'm going hunting in the forest, brother. I'll be away for ten days. Would you like to come with me before you go back to Samarkand? Thank you, brother, but I'm tired. You go, I'll stay here, replied Shah Zaman. He sat at his bedroom window all day. He thought about his wife and felt sad. He could see the garden of his brother's palace from his window. It was very beautiful. There were trees and flowers. There were peacocks. There was a fountain. There were also two people in the garden that day, a man and a woman. They were kissing and laughing. Shah Zaman looked at them carefully. The woman was his brother's wife, and the man was one of her slaves. Shah Zaman was very surprised. He thought, My brother's more important than me, but he's unlucky with his wife too. And he began to feel better. He started eating again. Part 2 When Sharaya came back from hunting and saw his brother, he said, You are well now, brother. I am happy. Tell me, why were you so sad before? Shah Zaman told him about his own wife and the kitchen boy. Then he told Sharaya about his wife and her slave. Sharaya loved his wife very much. He said, I don't believe you. My wife's a good woman. 
Go hunting again tomorrow," said his brother. "But come back secretly in the evening. Then you'll see them." So the next day, Shah Raya went to the forest. When it was dark, he returned on foot. In the morning, the king went to his brother's room and looked down into the garden. His wife and her slave were there. They were kissing and laughing. Shah Raya was very angry. He immediately called his vizier. "Kill them both," he said. "Oh, brother," said Shah Zaman. "There are no good women in the world. They are all bad." "You are right, brother," the king replied sadly. Soon after this, Shah Zaman went back to Samarkand. One night, a month or two later, Shah Raya said to his vizier, "I want a new wife." Go and find one for me. The vizier found a girl. He took her to the king's bedroom, and Shah Raya married her. In the morning, he said to his vizier, "Now kill her." The next night, he told his vizier to find him another girl. The vizier found one, and Shah Raya married her. In the morning, he told his vizier to kill her. Every night. The king married a different girl, and in the morning, his vizier killed her. The people in the kingdom became very angry with the king. They didn't like losing their daughters. One day, Shahrazad, the vizier's daughter, said, "Father, I'd like to marry the king. I want to try to help our people." She was a very intelligent girl. She read and studied a lot and knew many things. But when her father heard this, he was angry. You silly girl! The king will spend one night with you, and then in the morning I'll have to kill you. I want to help our people, father. Shahrazad said, "I have a plan. Please take me to the king." The vizier was sad, but he took her to the king. Later that night, when the king and Shahrazad were in bed, she started crying. Why are you crying? Asked the king.、Oh, I'd like to see my sister one more time before I die, she said. So the king sent for her sister, Dinazad. When she arrived, she went and sat next to Shahrazad and said, "Sister, tell me a story, please. The night will pass more pleasantly." Shahrazad began to tell a story. Dinazad listened. The king wasn't tired, so he listened too. She told one story, and started another one. But when she saw the first light of morning through the window, she stopped. I must know the end of that story," said the king. "You must finish it tomorrow." So her father didn't have to kill her in the morning. The next night, Shahrazad finished the story. And started another one. She continued to tell the king stories for one thousand and one nights. During this time, they had three children. Then one day, the king said, "You are a good and intelligent woman, Sharadzad. I will never kill you. You will be my queen." And they lived happily together for the rest of their lives. The Enchanted Horse. Part One. It was New Year in the city of Shiraz in Persia. The city square was full of people. The king and his family were there too. There was music and dancing. There were fire eaters and snake charmers, and of course there was a lot of delicious food and drink. Suddenly, an Indian man appeared in front of the king. He had a beautiful horse with him. It was made of black wood. The Indian spoke to the king. Your Majesty, this is a very special horse. Really? Said the king. Why is it special? What can it do? It can fly, Your Majesty. When I press this little button on its neck, it flies up into the air and takes me where I want to go. Your horse is certainly a very special horse," said the king. 
I'd like to have it for myself. I'll sell it to you, Your Majesty. And what's the price? asked the king. Your daughter. I want to marry your daughter, replied the Indian. That's a very high price for a horse. It isn't a high price for a horse that can fly, Your Majesty. Try it, and you'll see for yourself. Let my son Prince Firuz try the horse, said the king. Prince Firuz immediately jumped on the horse's back and pressed the button on its neck. The horse flew up into the air, into the clouds, and disappeared. The king was very angry. Where is my son? He shouted. Bring him back. I can't, replied the Indian. The king ordered his guards to put the Indian in prison. My guards will kill you if Prince Firuz isn't back in three months, he said. Meanwhile, the horse and the prince flew higher and higher. The prince was happy; he enjoyed flying on the horse. Then it began to get dark. It's late, he thought. I must land. He looked carefully at the horse's neck. And saw another little button. He pressed it, and the horse landed on the terrace of a beautiful white palace. He got off and looked around him. There was a small door in the corner of the terrace. He opened it and saw some stairs. He went down them and into a long hall with many doors. There was a light under one of them, so he opened it. Six guards were asleep on the floor. The light was coming from a lamp in another room behind a curtain. Prince Firuz moved the curtain and looked in. He saw a big sofa and some women asleep around it. On the sofa there was a very beautiful girl. Prince Firuz touched her arm gently, and she opened her eyes. Don't be afraid. He said, "I'm the son of the king of Persia. I don't want to hurt you. I'm lost and in danger." I'm the daughter of the Sultan of Bengal," said the princess. "Don't worry. You're safe in my palace." Then she called one of her maids and said to her, "Give the prince some food and a bed. We'll talk in the morning." The princess thought about the handsome young prince all night. The next morning, she put on her most beautiful dress and finest jewels and went out into the garden. Prince Firuz was there. He told her his story. "Dear princess, I must return home to my father," he said. "He doesn't know that I'm here." The princess was sad when she heard this. "Can't you stay for just two more days?" she asked. "I'm lonely here." My maids and the palace guards are my only companions. The prince looked at the sad face of the beautiful princess of Bengal, and decided to stay. Part two. The days became weeks, and the weeks became months. The prince and the princess fell in love. They wanted to get married. One day, Prince Firuz said, "I must go back to Persia." My father's waiting for me. Come with me. We can get married and live there. The princess agreed. So that night, after dark, they both got on the horse's back and flew across the skies to Persia. They landed in the garden of a small house outside the city. Stay here tonight, he told her. I'll come for you tomorrow. Then Prince Firuz went to his father's palace. The king was very happy to see his son again. He told the guards to bring the Indian to him. Take your horse and never enter my kingdom again, he said to him. The Indian was angry with the king because he put him in prison, and he was angry with Prince Firuz because he took his horse. He wanted his revenge. The palace guards told the Indian that his horse was in a house outside the city. So he went there the next day. A servant answered the door. The Indian said, "The prince is waiting for the princess. She must come with me to the palace." 
A few moments later, the princess was on the horse behind the Indian. They flew up into the air and in the direction of the palace. The prince and the king looked up and saw them. But the horse didn't land there. It flew over the palace and disappeared. The prince was afraid. The princess is in danger. I must go and look for her immediately, he said to his father. The horse took the Indian and the princess to India. It landed in a forest near the Sultan of Kashmir's palace. The princess started shouting for help. The Sultan was hunting in the forest that day, and he heard her. Perhaps that girl is in danger, he thought. I must go and save her. When he saw the Indian, he pulled out his sword and killed him. Then he put the princess on his horse and they rode back to his palace. Early the next morning, the princess heard a lot of noise outside her room. What's that noise? she asked a maid. The servants are preparing for your wedding. Tomorrow you will marry the Sultan, she said. The princess was horrified. I must do something, she thought. I can't marry the Sultan. I don't love him. She started shouting and crying and pulling her hair. The maid was afraid. She went to the Sultan and said, The princess is ill. She can't marry you tomorrow. Look after her, he said, and we'll get married when she's better. But weeks and months passed. Many doctors came to see the princess, but she didn't get better. Then, one day, a young doctor from Persia arrived at the palace gate. It was Prince Firuz. The princess was very happy to see him. We must escape, the prince told her. And I have a plan. But first, you must stop crying and smile at the sultan. So the princess stopped crying and smiled at the sultan. He was very happy. You are a very good doctor, he said to Prince Firuz. The princess is well now. You can go home. She isn't completely well, the prince said. The enchanted horse put a magic spell on her. Bring the horse and the princess to the square this afternoon, and I'll take away the spell. Tell all the people in the town to come and watch. At four o'clock that afternoon, the city square was full of people. The sultan and the princess were there too. When the guards brought the horse, Prince Firuz made four fires around it. He said some strange words and threw some powder into the fires. Suddenly, there was a lot of smoke. It was impossible to see anything. At that moment, Prince Firuz and the princess jumped on the horse's back and the horse flew up into the air. Soon, they arrived at the king's palace in Shiraz. The king and his people were very happy to see them. The next day, the prince and the princess got married, and they lived happily for the rest of their lives. Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves Part 1 Kazim and Ali Baba were brothers. They lived in a city in Persia. Kazim was rich. He had a shop. He bought and sold gold there. Ali Baba was poor. He collected wood in the forest and sold it in the city. One day, while he was collecting wood, Ali Baba heard the sound of horses' hooves in the distance. Who's coming here? he asked himself. Perhaps they are thieves and want to steal my wood. I'll hide in this tree. He quickly climbed up the tree and hid in the branches. The horsemen arrived. Ali Baba counted forty men. They were big and strong, and they had black beards. Each of them had a heavy saddlebag. I was right. They are thieves, thought Ali Baba. There was a big rock near the tree. The captain of the band of thieves went up to it and said, Open sesame! Immediately, 
a large door opened. They all went inside, and the door in the rock closed behind them. The captain and his men stayed in the cave for a long time. Ali Baba began to get tired. Suddenly, the door opened and they came out. Their saddlebags were empty now. The captain said, Shot sesame! And the door closed and disappeared. Then they got on their horses and rode away. Ali Baba climbed down the tree. I'll try those magic words. Perhaps there is treasure in the cave, he thought. Open sesame, he said, and the door in the rock opened. It wasn't very dark inside the cave, so he could see well. There were bags of precious jewels, rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. There were beautiful carpets and silk cloth. There were chests full of gold and silver coins. Ali Baba went back to his donkeys, took his bags, and went inside the cave. He filled his bags as quickly as he could with coins. Then he hid them under some wood on his donkeys. Shut, sesame, he said, and the door closed. When he arrived home and showed his wife the gold coins, her eyes became as big as dinner plates. She started counting them. Stupid woman, said Ali Baba. Go and get the scales from your sister in law. We must weigh them. There are too many to count. Ali Baba's wife went to Kazim's house and asked for the scales. Her sister in law was surprised. Ali Baba is a poor man, she thought. What does he want to weigh? Before giving the scales to Ali Baba's wife, she took the cup and put some wax on the bottom of it. When Ali Baba's wife brought the scales back the next day, her sister in law looked at the cup carefully. There was a gold coin sticking to the wax. That evening, she said to her husband, You think you are rich, but Ali Baba has more gold than you. He doesn't count his money, he weighs it. Kazim didn't sleep that night. He thought about his brother's gold. The next morning, he went to Ali Baba's house and showed him the gold coin. He said, Brother, you say you are poor, but I know that you weigh your gold. My wife found this coin in the cup of the scales. Where did you get it? Ali Baba was an honest man, so he told Kazim about the cave in the forest. When he heard about the treasure, Kazim wanted some of the gold too. Without saying anything to his wife or Ali Baba, he took ten donkeys, each with two bags, and went to the forest. He found the rock and said the magic words Open sesame! The door opened. He went inside the cave and immediately started filling his bags with coins and jewels. While he was filling the last bag, he heard the sound of horses' hooves outside. The thieves! he thought. What shall I do? They'll kill me. Where can I hide? He looked around the cave, but at that moment the door opened and the captain came in. Kazim tried to escape, but the captain caught him and killed him with his sword. Perhaps other people know about the cave. We'll leave his body here as a warning to them, said the captain. He cut Kazim's body into four pieces and put them around the door of the cave. Then, after putting the gold and silver back in the chests, the captain and the thieves left. Part 2 Kasim's wife was worried about her husband. He was late for dinner. She went to see Ali Baba. Brother in law, she said, I'm worried about Kazim. He's very late. Please go and find him. Tell him that I'm waiting to serve dinner. Ali Baba knew that his brother liked gold. He thought, Perhaps Kazim is in the cave. I'll go there first. 
When he opened the door of the cave and saw the pieces of his brother's body around the door, he was afraid. The thieves will kill me next, he thought. I must get out of here quickly. Before he left, he filled his bags with gold and put them on his donkeys. Then he put Kazim's body in another bag and rode back to his sister in law's house. One of Kazim's slaves opened the door. Her name was Morjana. Ali Baba gave her the bag with Kazim's body and some instructions about the funeral. Then he went to see his sister in law. She cried when she heard that her husband was dead. Sister in law, he said, we're in danger. Nobody must know how Kazim died. It must be a secret. Then he told her about the treasure and the thieves. Don't worry, he said. I'm rich now. I'll marry you and look after you. My wife and I will come and live in this house. When Kazim's wife heard this, she stopped crying. Morjana was a clever girl. She understood Ali Baba's instructions about Kazim's funeral and she knew what to do. She went to see Baba Mustafa, the shoemaker, in the market. She gave him a gold coin and said, I have a special job for you, Baba Mustafa. Cover your eyes with this cloth and come with me. He was a poor man, so he took the coin and covered his eyes. Morjana took him through the streets of Baghdad to Kazim's house. When he took off the cloth, he was in a dark room. Sew those pieces together again, she said to him, and pointed to the four pieces of Kazim's body on a table. Then make a bag for the body. Mustafa worked all day. When the body was in the bag, Morjana gave Mustafa another gold coin, covered his eyes, and took him back to his shop. Three days after Kazim's funeral, Ali Baba moved into his house. In the meantime, the thieves returned to the cave. Where's the body of that man? Where's our gold? They asked angrily. The captain said, Someone knows the magic words. We must find him and kill him before he steals the rest of our treasure. He told his best man to dress himself as a merchant and go to the city. Come back when you find the man who knows the magic words, he said. It was early morning and still dark when the thief arrived in the market square. Only Mustafa was awake. He was sewing shoes outside his shop. How can you see to sew? asked the thief. It's dark. I am old, but my eyes are still good, replied Mustafa. Yesterday I sewed four pieces of a body together in a dark room. Take me to that house, and I'll give you these gold coins, said the thief. Mustafa put the coins in his pocket. Follow me, he said. He had a good memory, so it wasn't difficult for him to remember the way. When they arrived at Ali Baba's house, the thief took out a piece of white chalk and put a cross on the door. Then he thanked Mustafa and rode back to the forest. Morjana returned home from the market. She was surprised to see the cross on the door. Perhaps someone wants to hurt my master, she thought, and she put a white cross on all the other doors in the street. When the captain arrived and saw that there were white crosses on all the doors, he was angry. He rode back to the forest and killed his best man. The next day, he sent his second best man to Mustafa. This time, the thief put a red cross on the door. Morjana saw the cross and put red crosses on all the other doors. When the captain arrived and saw that there were red crosses on all the doors, he was angrier than before. He rode back to the forest and killed his second best man. Tomorrow, I will go and find this man's house, he said. 
When he returned from the city, he called his men together. We must kill this man and take back our gold and jewels, he said, and I have a plan. Part 3 The captain told his men to bring him 38 big oil jars. He filled one of the jars with oil and told his men to climb into the others. Then he put the jars on donkeys. He dressed himself as a merchant and rode to Ali Baba's house. Morjana opened the door. I'm an oil merchant, he said. All the hotels in the city are full and it's late. Can the master of the house give me a bed for the night? Ali Baba was happy to help the merchant. Tell him to leave his jars downstairs, he said to Morjana. After dinner, the captain went downstairs and whispered to his men in the jars. When I say, it's time, break the jars and come upstairs. Then he went to bed. Morjana was in the kitchen. She wanted to make some soup, but she didn't have any oil. The merchant's jars are full of oil, she thought. I'll take some from one of them. She took her pan and went downstairs. While she was closing the door, a voice from inside one of the jars said, Is it time yet? She was very surprised. She answered, No, it isn't time yet. She went to another jar. A voice said, is it time yet? She gave the same answer as before. She went to the other jars, one by one. She heard the same question from inside each one, and she gave the same answer. Only one jar didn't speak. She opened it. It was full of oil. She filled her pan and went back upstairs. The merchant wants to kill my master, she thought. I must do something. She heated the oil on the fire until it was very hot. Then she went downstairs and poured some of the boiling oil into each of the jars. Now we are all safe and I can sleep in peace, Morjana said to herself. At midnight, the captain came downstairs. It's time, he whispered. Nothing happened. He opened one of the jars and looked inside. He was horrified. He looked inside the other jars. All his men were dead, boiled in oil. Ali Baba is a dangerous man, he thought, and he ran back to the forest. Ali Baba saw the jars the next day and asked Morjana, Why are the merchant's jars still here? Morjana showed him the bodies in the jars. Well done! You are a very clever girl, Ali Baba said. Many months passed. The captain changed his name to Kawaja Hussein and bought a shop in the market square. He sold the cloth and carpets from the cave. He became friends with the other shopkeepers. One of them was a young man. One day, Ali Baba visited the young man's shop. The captain saw him. Later, he asked his young friend, Who was that man in your shop today? That was my father, Ali Baba, the boy replied. The captain was surprised. That's interesting, he thought. He still wanted to kill Ali Baba. Some weeks after that, Ali Baba's son went to his father and said, Father, I would like to invite my friend Kawaja Hussein to dinner tomorrow. Of course, replied Ali Baba. I'll ask Morjana to make something special to eat. The next evening, the captain arrived at Ali Baba's house. When Morjana saw him, she said to herself, This is the merchant who wanted to kill my master. He has another plot. I must do something. She served dinner, and then she put on a very beautiful dress. She went to the cook and said, 
Tonight I'm going to dance for our master's guest, and you're going to play the tambourine for me. Come, let's go to them now. Morjana danced some beautiful dances. The last one was very exciting. She had a dagger in her hand. After this dance, Morjana took the tambourine from the cook and went to the men. Both Ali Baba and his son put a gold coin in it. Then she went to the captain. He put his hand in his pocket to take out some money, but just at that moment, Morjana took her dagger and plunged it into his heart. He fell to the floor, dead. Ali Baba was shocked. Morjana, why did you do that? He said. He was the captain of the band of thieves, and he wanted to kill you. She replied. She lifted the man's jacket, and showed Ali Baba the knife in his belt. You are a very clever woman, Morjana, he said. Then he looked at his son, and said to him, "Son, you must marry Morjana. She is the cleverest woman in Persia." The Second Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor, Part One. There was once a sailor from Baghdad called Sinbad. He made seven long voyages in his life. They were all full of adventures. He met many strange people and saw many strange things. When he was old, he liked telling people about his adventures, and they liked listening. This is the story of his second voyage. When I returned home from my first voyage, I lived a comfortable life in the city for some years. Then I began to get bored. I dreamt of sailing the seas again. I wanted new adventures. One morning, I packed my chest and travelled to the port of Basra. There was a good, strong ship in the harbour, and it was ready to sail. I got on it. We travelled from port to port and from island to island. The other passengers on the ship were merchants, and when we stopped, they bought and sold things. Soon, I began to do the same. Weeks and months passed pleasantly, but without adventure. Then, one day, the wind took our ship to a strange and beautiful island. There were trees with delicious fruit, flowers of many colours, and streams of sweet water. The air was full of the songs of birds, but there weren't any people. The other passengers started to explore the island. I was tired, so I sat under a tree. I ate some of the delicious fruit from the trees, and drank some of the sweet water from the streams. Then I fell asleep. When I woke up, I looked around. I was alone on the island. I looked out to sea and saw my ship on the horizon. I began to feel afraid. Oh, poor me! I said, "What shall I do now?" I walked around the island for an hour or more. Then I climbed a tall tree. I can get a better view of the island from the top of a tree. I thought. I looked left and right, but I saw only trees, flowers, birds, the sea, and the sky. Then, I looked more carefully. There was a big white object in the distance. I decided to go and have a look at it. When I got nearer, I saw that it was a dome. I touched it and walked round it. It was very smooth. And very big, but there were no doors or windows in it. Suddenly, it became dark. I looked up and saw an enormous bird above me. It covered the sun. A rock, I said to myself, and this white dome is her egg. I remembered a traveller's story about these birds. It said that rocks caught elephants for their babies to eat. 
Just at that moment, the bird landed on top of her egg, and soon she was asleep. I quickly took off my turban and tied one end of it to the rock's foot and the other around my waist. Perhaps this bird will take me to a land where there are cities and people, I thought. I waited all night. In the morning, the rock woke up and flew away. And she took me with her. She didn't take me very far. We landed on the side of a mountain. I quickly untied my turban, and hid behind a rock. The rock picked up a huge snake in its talons, and flew away. I looked around me. I saw a lot more snakes. They were sleeping among the rocks. This is a Terrible place, I thought. There was fruit to eat and water to drink on the island, but there are only snakes here. Listening activity. The island of Sri Lanka is in the Indian Ocean, southeast of India. It is shaped like a big pear, with the small part in the north and the large part in the south. The greatest length. Is four hundred and forty kilometers, and the greatest width is two hundred and twenty kilometers. The largest city, Colombo, is on the west coast. The port town of Trincomalee is on the northeast coast. It has one of the best natural harbors in the world. Gal is another port town. It is on the southwest coast. In the south central part of the island, there are many high mountains. The highest mountain is Mount Piduro Talagala. It is two thousand five hundred and twenty-four meters high. In the north, the land is flat and dry. There are many rivers and streams in Sri Lanka, especially in the south central region. The longest river is the Mahaveli Ganga. It is three hundred and thirty-five kilometers long. It starts in the mountains in the south central region and empties into the Indian Ocean south of Trincomalee. Part two. I walked down into the valley. There weren't any trees or flowers, only sand and rocks. The small stones under my feet sparkled in the sunshine. I looked at them more carefully. They weren't stones; they were diamonds. Then I knew where I was. This is the Valley of Diamonds, I said to myself. Nobody escapes from here. I began to feel very afraid. I looked around. The snakes were still asleep among the rocks; their bodies were as thick as tree trunks. They'll wake up when it is dark, I thought, and come out to look for food. I must find a safe place to sleep tonight. Perhaps there are some caves here. It was beginning to get dark, and I could hear the snakes. They were waking up. I walked faster. Soon, I found a cave. It was big and dark inside, but the floor was dry. This is a good place to sleep, I thought. I'll put a big rock in the mouth of the cave to keep the snakes out. I'll be safe here until the morning. I went in and looked around. At the back of the cave, I could see. Two small red lights, two eyes. There was a huge snake there. She was sitting on her eggs. She was looking at me. I ran out of the cave. It was completely dark in the valley now, and the snakes in the rocks were coming out. They made a terrible noise. I was very afraid. I decided to stay in the cave. One snake is better than a hundred, I thought. 
and she is more interested in her eggs than she is in me. So, I found a rock and closed the cave. I was awake all night. I could hear the snakes outside. The noise was terrible. The snake at the back of the cave sat on her eggs and looked at me. When I saw the first light from the sun, I moved the rock and went out. It was quiet. The snakes were asleep, so I left the cave and started walking down the valley. Suddenly, something fell out of the sky and landed at my feet. It was a big piece of meat. Then another piece of meat fell out of the sky. I was very surprised, but I remembered another traveller's story about the Valley of Diamonds. The story said that diamond merchants never came into the valley because it was a very dangerous place, but they had a very clever way of getting the diamonds out. They stood on the tops of the mountains and threw big pieces of meat down into the valley. The meat was soft, so the precious stones stuck to it. At midday, rocks and eagles flew down into the valley. They picked up the pieces of meat and carried them up to the tops of the mountains. When the birds landed, the merchants shouted loudly and made a lot of noise. The birds were afraid and flew away. Then the merchants took the diamonds out of the meat and put them into chests. This was the only way of getting the diamonds out of the valley. Later, the merchants sold the precious stones in the cities for a lot of money. The story gave me an idea. I filled my pockets with the biggest diamonds I could find. Then I tied myself to a piece of meat with my turban. Soon an eagle came down. It picked up the piece of meat and me and flew up to the top of a mountain with it. As soon as we landed, there was a lot of noise and shouting. The bird was afraid and flew away. I untied myself quickly and started to run. Hey, you, stop! A man shouted. I stopped. Don't hurt me, sir, I said. I'm an honest man. I don't want your diamonds. I took three big diamonds out of my pocket. Look, I said. Take these. I picked them up in the valley. And I gave him the stones. The man was very happy and thanked me. He took me to meet his friends. They were all diamond merchants. They gave me food and drink and listened to my story. One of them said, You're the first man to escape from this valley. I travelled with them for many weeks. We visited many countries and we had many adventures. I gave them diamonds and they gave me food and drink. In one port there was a ship that was going to Basra. I was tired of travelling and I wanted to see my family again, so I got on it. From Basra I travelled back to Baghdad. I was happy to be home again. I was a rich man. I gave many presents to my family and money to the poor people of the city. I enjoyed my comfortable life at home. But after a few years, I started to get bored. I wanted to travel the seas again and have new adventures. The Story of the Young King of the Black Islands Part 1 when King Mahmud of the Black Islands died, his young son became king. A few weeks later, he married his cousin. The young king loved his wife very much, and he thought that she loved him. He was happy, but she was not a good wife, and she didn't love him. She also had magic powers. 
The king and the queen lived happily for five years. Then one afternoon, the young king heard a conversation between two of his wife's maids. They didn't know that he was listening to them. It's sad that the queen doesn't love the king, isn't it? One of them said. Yes, it is. The other maid replied. She's a bad woman. Every night she puts a sleeping potion in his wine. Then, when he is asleep, she goes out to meet her lover in the forest. The young king was horrified. He decided to watch his wife carefully. That night, he didn't drink his wine, so he wasn't asleep when the queen got out of bed and left the palace. He followed her to the forest. Her lover was there, and they kissed passionately. When the young king saw them together, he was very angry. He took out his sword and hit the man on the neck. The man fell to the ground. Then the young king ran back to the palace before the queen had time to see his face. The next morning, the queen came to his room. She was wearing black clothes. And she was crying. Husband, she said, "I'm mourning my family. My father, my mother, and my two brothers are all dead." The young king said nothing. He knew that it was not true. The queen mourned for a year. At the end of this time, she built a black dome in the palace garden and filled it with precious carpets and paintings. Then she took her lover's body there. He wasn't dead, but he couldn't move or speak. She put him on a sofa in a dark room and built a beautiful fountain for him there. She went to see him every day and gave him soup and wine to drink. She cried all the time. Three years passed. One day, the young king went to the dome to speak to his wife. She was crying as usual. He was very angry. I'm tired of your tears! He shouted, and he took out his sword. You are a bad woman. I know that you keep your lover here. Yes, I do. The queen replied. I love him, and I hate you. The king lifted his sword to kill her, but the queen put a magic spell on him before he could hit her. She turned his legs into a block of black marble. He couldn't move. Then she turned the four islands into four mountains, the city into a lake, and the people in the city into fish. Part two. After that, the queen visited the black dome every day. First, she went to her husband. And beat him one hundred times with a whip. He cried and shouted loudly, but her heart was hard. Then she went to her lover. After giving him some soup and wine, she said, "How are you today, my love? Speak to me." But he never moved, and he never spoke. Some years later, a king from a distant country travelled to the Black Islands. He went in the black dome and found the young king. When he heard his story, he felt very sorry for him. He promised to help him. I have a plan, he said. The next day, the king went to the room where the queen's lover was. He killed him with his sword and threw the body down a deep well. Then he lay down on the sofa. Soon. The queen arrived. She went to her husband, and beat him one hundred times. After that, she went to her lover's room. It was dark, so she couldn't see the man on the sofa very well. How are you today, my love? She said. Speak to me. The king answered. I'm very tired. When you beat your husband, he shouts very loudly. And I can't sleep. Take the spell off. I don't want to hear him any more. The queen was very happy to hear her lover's voice again. She said, 
I'll take the spell off immediately, my love. She went back to her husband's room and took a cup of water, which she heated on a fire. Then she said some magic words and threw the water over the block of marble. Now you are free, she said. Go away from here and never come back. The young king jumped for joy, and the queen went back to her lover's room. My husband is free, she said. Are you better now, my love? The king answered, I'm still tired. Every night at midnight, the fish in the lake jump out of the water and cry and shout loudly. I can't sleep. Take the spell off. I don't want to hear them any more. The queen immediately ran to the lake and took the spell off. The fish became men, women, and children again, and the lake became a city. The queen went back to her lover's room and said, The people are free. Do you feel better now? Come here, said the king. Come closer. The queen moved closer. Then the king suddenly jumped up and cut her body in half with his sword. The queen is dead, he said to the young king, and your city and your people are free. The young king was very happy. Why don't you come back with me to my country? asked the king. I have no children of my own. You can be my son and rule my kingdom when I die. Thank you, I will, replied the young king immediately. I never want to leave you. Good, said the king. I'll send my vizier to the Black Islands. He'll be a good sultan. So the two kings made preparations for their long journey back to the king's country. They arrived safely, and they both lived peacefully for the rest of their lives.